All right, let's do it again. Let's answer another definite integral question. Why? Because definite integrals are super duper important. You could argue that it's the most fundamental concept for all of calculus too. In fact, I made that argument in the very first video in this series where I said, really, the goal of this class is to figure out how much area you have underneath the given curve between two given x values. And while we've already answered that question in the previous video, we did it for kind of an easier curve with easier, more simplified bounds. Let's try to make it a little bit more challenging to get a more general understanding of what we're doing. So instead of x squared, let's do x cubed. Instead of going from 0 to 1, let's go from 2 to 5 to pick some somewhat arbitrary endpoints. And I'm not even going to write it in English. I'm not going to say find the area underneath the curve, y equals x cubed from x equals 2 to x equals 5. I'm just going to write this mess of symbols, and you are to understand what this is asking. And while you don't need a picture, here's a picture just to help you reference stuff. We want to go from 2 to 5 on the x-axis and find the area underneath this curve, y equals x cubed. And FYI, those x values correspond with y values of 8 and 125 because 2 cubed is 8 and 5 cubed is 125. Although that's not really things you need, it might just help give context of what we're doing. So how do you solve this problem? Well, let's start with what's given. All right, we've given the bounds of this definite integral. Those are always a and b. So a in this case is 2 and b in this case is 5. If you're the type that likes formulas, you might have this memorized our formula for the definite integral, although I'd encourage you to do it without having this written down. Because this is really just saying we're adding up the area of a whole bunch of different rectangles. And as you know, the area of a rectangle is just the length of the base of the rectangle times the height of the rectangle. Anyways, to use this formula, I'll need to know what delta x is and I'll need to know what xi is equal to. Maybe these are formulas you have memorized. Maybe you understand them at this point. Delta x is always b minus a over n. And that makes sense because delta x is the length of each individual rectangle. And all the rectangles together have to span a length from 2 to 5. How much length is there from 2 to 5? Well, 5 minus 2, in other words, 3. Divided by n, because I have n rectangles to span that space. Anyways, I'm getting sick of saying that. You're probably getting sick of hearing it. In this case, delta x is 3 over n. That's the length of each of our individual n rectangles. xi, which is used to specify the height of the ith rectangle. xi gives you the x value that corresponds with the height of that rectangle, f of xi will end up being the height of the rectangle. The xi is just its x-coordinate. xi is always a plus i delta x. Oh, right, because if I think about like the ith rectangle somewhere in here, the way I can refer to its x value is start at 2 and then add a whole bunch of delta x's until I get to that point. Start at 2 and then add these delta x's. In this case, a is equal to 2, and delta x is 3 over n, and what I want is i times delta x. So I suppose I could write it this way. It's kind of ugly. Typically it's written as 2 plus 3i over n. Now that I have those, I can plug them into this formula. I can say this question is just this, which is kind of intimidating, but all I'm doing is copying what you see here, right? Or I'm understanding this. I'm saying that to figure out the area underneath the curve, I need to add up a whole bunch of rectangles, and later on there's going to be infinitely many of those rectangles. But for now, just think about it as n rectangles. And what I'm really adding up is each of these rectangles areas. Here's the width of the rectangle. Here's the height of the rectangle. Wait, why is this the height of the rectangle? Because this is referring to the right endpoint, the x coordinate that corresponds with the right endpoint of that rectangle. And the heights of our rectangles are based on their right endpoints. To get the height from the x value, you got to cube that thing. To get the height right here, I have to take this 5 and cube it, which gives me this 125. If I can evaluate this limit, I would have the area underneath the curve. It's an ugly limit, but maybe we can kind of chip away at it, right? These, every copy, remember I have n different copies of these, each of these terms look the exact same, except for one thing, the i. The first term would be 3 over n times 2 plus 3 times 1 over n cubed. The second term would be 3 over n times 2 plus 3 times 2 over n cubed. The point is the only thing that changes is the i. Everything else is just a constant. All right, I can do stuff with constants. Well, it's a little bit hard to factor constants out right now because they're kind of hidden inside this cube. So we're going to expand out these parentheses so that we'll be able to factor out constants. It's an algebraic nightmare, but we can do it. When we expand out this polynomial, we can write it right here, and then we'll have something that we can deal with. Expanding out this polynomial is messy enough that I want to do it off to the side. 
There's shortcut ways that you can expand binomials like this raised up to any power. But I kind of feel like if you don't already have those formulas memorized, it's not worth your time to memorize them. I think a better way to think about it is cubing something means multiplying it by itself three times. So just think kind of FOIL and then repeated FOIL, although that acronym won't really work out that well. I'm going to take the first two of these terms and I'm going to multiply them together. So 2 times 2 gives me 4. 2 times 3i over n gives me 6i over n. But this 3i over n times this 2 gives me another 6i over n. So in total, I have 12i over n. And then 3i over n times 3i over, 3i over n gives me 9i squared over n squared. And now I repeat, although I can't use f, o, i, and l, but I can kind of think about this 4 as getting multiplied by these two terms. So I got an 8 and a 12i over n. And then this 12i over n has to get multiplied by these two terms. So I have a 24i over n and a 36i squared over n squared. And then finally, this term has to get multiplied by each of these two terms. So when I take this term times the 2, I get 18i squared over n squared. When I take this term times the 3i over n, I get 27i cubed over n cubed. And then when I might notice that these two are like terms and these two are like terms. So if I combine like terms by adding their coefficients, I get this nicer looking polynomial right here. So 2 plus 3i over n cubed is equal to this. So I can come back up here and replace 2 plus 3i over n cubed with this expression. Good. Now all we have to do to get rid of the parentheses is take this 3 over n and distribute it through. Relatively straightforward. 3 over n times 8 is 24 over n. 3 over n times 36i over n is 3 times 36 gives me 108i divided by n squared. 3 over n times 54i squared over n squared. 3 times 54 is 162, I think, i squared divided by n cubed. And finally, 3 over n times 27i cubed over n cubed. 3 times 27 is 81i cubed divided by n to the 4. Wow, okay, this is getting really ugly, but don't lose faith. This isn't going to be that bad. Now all we have to do is evaluate this limit. Evaluating limits when you have sigmas in there is really, really hard. If only there was a way to get rid of this sigma so that I could evaluate this limit. Oh, wait. Good old fall hobber to the rescue again. Right? The sum, I can get rid of these sigmas right here. If I could write it as the sum of i, the sum of i squared, or the sum of i cubed. I have these Fallhaber formulas which allow me to get rid of sigmas. And remember, getting rid of sigmas is your goal because once you get rid of sigmas, you can evaluate the limits. The only problem is I don't currently have the sum from i equals 1 to n of i, nor the sum from i equals 1 to n of i squared, nor the sum from i equals 1 to n of i cubed. It's not what I have right now. I got this huge mess. But look, here's the i. You're going to end up with the sum from i equals 1 to n of i if you could just get rid of this 108 over n squared. And you can because the 108 over n squared is going to end up being a constant. Similarly, here's your i squared, here's your i cubed. Yeah, but how am I going to isolate those guys? Remember these formulas? This is the one we used in the previous video that says if you have a constant, you can pull it out in front of sigma. But before we use that, we can use this third fact. It says that if you have the sum of a whole bunch of terms, and each of those terms individually involves multiple terms, then you can break that up into two different sigmas. The way to think about this guy is multiplication is commutative. So if I have x1 plus y1, x2 plus y2, x3 plus y3, I can change the order I'm adding things up and add up all the x's first and then add up all the y's. That's what I'm gonna do down here. This requires a little bit of mental gymnastics, but picture this sum. Each term in this sum actually has four terms associated with it. When i equals 1, I copy down these four terms, changing all the i's into 1's. And then when i equals 2, I copy down these four terms, changing all the i's into 2's, and then 3's and then 4's. So I have all these different copies of these four terms. I could change their orders if I wanted to. I could take the first of those four terms from each copy and write those first. And then I could take the second of those terms from each copy and write those second then the third, and then the fourth. And if I did that, I'd get here. Whoa, wait, what just happened? This is just the first of these four when they're all expanded, written together. Each copy of these four terms starts out with one of these. So you could write them all at the start. Similarly, each copy contains one of these terms, and then these, and then these. This line is equal to this line. What's advantageous about this line? Now it's easier to see the constants. Right, folks, pick whichever one, this third one, for example. 
Think about what you have here. The sum from i equals 1 to n of 162i squared over n cubed. The 162 and the n cubed is the exact same in every single term. It's a constant. You can pull it out in front of this sigma. Similarly, the 108 over n squared is a constant. The 81 over n to the fourth is a constant. And in this one, the 24 over n itself is all a constant. Nothing is changing in the different copies of this term because the only thing that ever changes is the i's and there's no i's in this term. I can rewrite this line as, as this line, right? This first term, I'm taking the 24 over n, the constant, and pulling it out in front. So what's left is just this one as a placeholder. This next term, the 108 over n squared goes out in front and only the i is left. That's what you see right here. 108 over n squared times the sum from i equals one to n of i. And same thing with this term and this term. The advantage is now you have the sum from i equals one to n of i cubed. The sum from i equals one to n of i squared. The sum from i equals one to n of i. That's where you use those Fallhaber formulas. These guys right here, which by the way, I don't need you to memorize. When I put this on a quiz or something, I'll be like, hint, and give you exactly what's written right here. The rest of these facts, I will want you to have memorized. This, you do not need to have memorized. I'll provide you with Fallhaber's formula. You might note that there is no Fallhaber formula for the sum from i equals one to n of the number one. There kind of should be, but it doesn't typically get referred to as one of Fallhaber's formulas. However, I gave it to you right here when we were talking about some properties of sigmas. All right, so rules two and three allow us to take the constants out in front and allows us to, to move the sigmas to each of the different terms in the sum. Um, there's also this one that says the sum from i equals one to n of the number one is always just equal to n. Oh, right, if you add up n copies of the number one, your answer is gonna be n. What do you get if you add up eight ones? Well, you get eight. All, right, so all I'm gonna do here is apply Fallhaber's formulas. So if I do that, I still have the constants out in front, so 24 over n, but instead of writing this sum, I can just write what it's equal to, n in this case. Similarly, I'll still have this constant out in front, 108 over n squared, but I can replace the sum from i equals one to n of i with what that sum is equal to, and good old Fallhaber tells me that that's n times n plus one over two. In this third term, I still have the constant out in front, 162 over n cubed, except now I need to replace the sum from i equals one to n of i squared with n times n plus one times two n plus one over six. If you haven't memorized, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. I'll supply it. And what will happen is if you do enough of these, you accidentally memorize them. That's where I am. And for the fourth term, the constant is 81 over n to the fourth. And Fallhaber's formula tells me that the sum from i equals one to n of i cubed is, is n times n plus one over two, that entire thing squared. Wow. What a mess, right? What a disaster this is. I disagree. This is awesome, right? This is 2.5 work. This is essentially, you're done. That's the finish line, right? I mean, yeah, you got to multiply some numbers. You got to do a little bit of basic algebra. Like, can you distribute n times n plus one? But you could do that. You might make a mistake, but I don't really care. You understand how to do that, right? Now, let's just go through the motions and evaluate this limit. Let's see if we can clean this up. This first term, 24 over n times n, that sure sounds like 24 to me. This next term, maybe I can cancel out a two and a 108 and call that 54 up top. And then n times n plus one is n squared plus n. So this second term can be rewritten this way. Make sure you can follow all those steps. For this third term, all right, maybe you're just pulling out a calculator, but I'm gonna show off a little bit. This 162 was what, 54 times three. So the three that makes up this six and the three times 54 can cancel out here. And so I get 54 divided by two, and 54 divided by two is 27. What I'm saying is I think 162 divided by six is 27. So I can write 27 times, and then this product. And I multiplied this product out in the last one, but you could foil n plus one times two n plus one to get two n squared plus three n plus one. And then take the n and distribute it through. And when the dust settles, I believe this is what you'll be left with. The 162 and the six is the 27. The n cubed is still here. And expanding this gets you this. The last term doesn't simplify super nicely, but I suppose what you could do is we're gonna have to square this whole thing out. n times n plus one, as we saw over here, is n squared plus n. And then two squared is four. The 81 and the four won't simplify at all. So I can kind of leave the 81 and the four, two squared, in here and then this end of the four things out right here and as I said n times n plus one is n squared plus n which we still need to square out 
You can go a lot farther if you want. You can start expanding things and canceling out terms, but I think there's enough here for you to see the answer. And this might be asking a lot, but let's see how this goes. So I think we can evaluate this limit. The first term, change all the ends into infinity. There are no ends. Oh, right, so that's just 24. For this second term, if you kind of think about the 54 is just hanging out, and then the largest power you see is n squared. You divide everything by n squared. This is a 1, this is a 1, this is a 1 over n, which turns into a 0. So I just get 54 times 1 divided by 1, I just get 54. For the third term, you divide everything by n cubed. This won't matter, this won't matter. This will be a 2, this will be a 27, this will be a 1. 2 times 27, that sounds like 54. For the last term, well, if you were to expand out n squared plus n, if you're going to square that, n squared plus n times n squared plus n, you'd have n to the fourth plus 2n cubed plus n squared. Don't follow that? Don't worry, you don't need to. If you were going to expand this out, you would have 1n to the fourth. n to the fourth would be the biggest power, and the coefficient on that would be a 1. Let me try to detail that. Does this help to see it this way, maybe? n squared plus n squared, think FOIL, that gets you here. Now divide everything by n to the fourth. You're just going to have a 4 here. You're going to have a 1 here. You're going to have something that approaches 0 here and something that approaches 0 here. So when I evaluate the limit, I get 81 times 1 divided by 4. I get 81 fourths. This is my answer, whatever these numbers add up to. See, 54 and 54 is 108, plus another 24 is 132, I think. 132 and 81 fourths, which I don't really like mixed numbers, so I suppose we can multiply this by 4 and get 528, I think. This is the limits of what I can do. And 528 plus 81 is 609, maybe? This might be equal to 609 over 4 which I'm going to call good enough. I'm going to call that the answer to this question.